Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. Today, I'm live from the Gibson Guitar Factory in Memphis, Tennessee with Jonathan Blocker. Jonathan is the plant manager at the Gibson Guitar Factory, but before Gibson, Jonathan worked at appliance manufacturer Electrolux, climate control producer Lennox International, and medical device company Orchid. He also holds a degree in industrial engineering from Kettering University in Detroit, Michigan. Jonathan, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Well, it was really exciting to meet you, and thank you also for taking us on a tour of your plant here in Memphis. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to actually get a chance to see how the guitars are made here. Um, And I'm curious, though, can you talk to us a little bit about what kinds of guitars do you make here? Yeah, so Gibson has uh, three different uh, plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, We make the ES version, the uh, semi-acoustic, ES stands for Electric Spanish, uh, and uh, it's a very popular guitar mm-hmm. uh, used with some pretty famous people, uh, Larry Carlton, Chuck Berry. If, I don't know if you know uh, the Johnny B. Good song yeah. from uh, Back to the Future made that kind of popular, but that those are some famous players. Uh, more recently, uh, Dave Grohl, his signature guitar is here, the Trini Lopez, and uh, obviously the B.B. King, which is the Lucille. That's one of our guitars that we make here. Yeah, that's amazing. And you were saying they are, are they mainly blues guitars or? Yeah, so they have a warm, a nice warm tone to them. They're, uh, they, they, they're very, they, they, they're very good with the jazz and the blues um, genres. But, you know, people use them for rock as well. I mean, Dave Grohl uses it for their his main guitar, so he's all very much rock. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, you know, we did get a chance to walk through the factory, but I do still have some questions to be sure. able to share, you know, with our listeners. Do you manufacture all of the pieces here? Or do you just assemble the guitars here? What what happens in terms of your manufacturing process? Yeah, so we, uh, we manufacture everything here. We have raw material, just the wood that comes in. Uh, we do all the processing, all the cutting, all the sanding, all the mm-hmm. routing, all is done here. Uh, all the staining and painting and, and lacquer and all the buffing and the final assembly is all done right here. Oh, that's so great. And how long has this plant been here? Uh, this plant has been in Memphis since 2000. So okay. just late, the late part of 2000 is when it gets started. All right. And we are going to get into some really interesting career-specific questions. Yeah. But for people who are listening that are interested in guitars or who just like to see how things are made, you do actually have tours here. We do. We have uh, about four or five tours a day. Uh-huh. They start at about 1130, and uh, they go throughout the entire day, and they get to see the entire process. We have professional tour guides. They'll walk them through, and yeah. we love to have them there. We it's, love interacting with them. It's an awesome tour. So definitely if you're in Memphis, I would – be sure to check it out. Well, um, I also want to talk specifically about your own career background. So your undergrad is in industrial engineering. Yes. And, but you, you know, you have a role that's much more sort of leadership based. You know, you you are the head of the plant here and you're managing a number of people. Mm -hmm. Um, So I work with a lot of people who actually come from a technology background that want to shift into business. And they find it's a really hard transition to make sometimes because they don't really feel taken seriously during that transition. What do you feel from your own career? I mean, how were you able to make that transition? Um, You know, it's it's interesting. I think the biggest thing for me is to remember that... um, everybody's buying something, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Employers are are purchasing talent, uh, not to be too crude about it, but they're purchasing talent from from different people and and they're looking for the right fit. Right. Uh, One of the things that you have to remember when selling yourself is that uh, you have to connect with the other person that's, you know, doing the buying and saying, hey, what is it that they need? If I Mm -hmm. come from an industry that you know, made widgets in Timbuktu and now I'm making guitars in Memphis, there's still some very similar, uh, very similar things that they both find valuable. Mm -hmm. So uh, one company has value in uh, efficiency and revenue and and, uh, good human relations and the other company will have the same. They both want to make money and so that's what they're going to have as a commonality. And Mm -hmm. you just have to find out what that commonality is and then 
use your background and talk in those terms. It's just the way you sell yourself. So do you feel like when you've done that, that everyone gets it? Or do you feel there's maybe some people who get that kind of crossover more than others? Um, I run into people that are very traditional all the time. Mm -hmm. you, you know, industry now is very, uh, it's, it's up and coming. A lot of people are a little bit more modern the way they think. And so it's not as much as it used to be, but definitely in some of the older sectors, mm -hmm. uh, some older mindsets will be like, well, so-and-so doesn't have experience running this one machine. And so that they definitely will not be able to work here. And that's, that's just not the case. You know, mm -hmm. when I look to people, the higher end that work for me, I always say that I'm not as concerned with what your background was as long as you're um, willing to learn, willing mm -hmm. to work, and have a great attitude. And those are the, really the only three things I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there might be some educational background that I need to have in the role, right. but for the most part, we can teach anything that we need to teach. I really, really like that attitude. Like I appreciate it a lot because I feel like things like self-discipline or attitude are not necessarily things you can teach someone. Yeah. But you can teach really like simple technical skills. You, can, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can teach that are different. I mean, I, I don't know if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that you'll find, <clears throat> excuse me, in, the, in an interview, I'll be like, oh, this person's really great or whatever. And what you, what you have to determine in the interviewing process is, is the person sitting in front of me going to, in two months down the road in this job, the real person come out mm -hmm. and the one that doesn't have a good work ethic or has problems with people or has an anger issue. And, right. and, and you have to discern that uh, from the interview, interviewer. But as an interviewee, uh, you have to think, okay, these are these are skills that are universal, right? And they're very valuable to any company. Uh, if you have some core engineering background, like I do, uh, it's really easy to translate that into any business, depending on wherever you want to go. You just have to know how to sell it. Yeah, I feel like as an engineer, you know how to learn. Like, right, that's exactly. One thing you know that's, how to do. <laughs> Ninety percent of the things that I learned in college, I don't even really use anymore. But they taught me how to think critically and how mm -hmm. to. Um, uh, how to solve problems in certain ways and, and selling yourself to a, to a future employer is really just another problem to be solved. Yeah, absolutely. So as a hiring manager, you mentioned you have to sort of be able to tell who that person really is. Do you just do it kind of intuitively or do you have kind of a process? Uh, <laughs> um, that's debatable. If you go to my track record, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, I, I like to think it's an intuitive thing. You know, you, you see the way people interact with certain questions, people that struggle with certain things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can you can draw some lines and say, hey, you know, this person might have a, an issue with X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. But it's really just a guess. Yeah. You know, you really have to um, you you have to try it out a lot of times. If you get a good feeling about somebody. You, you make that plunge and, you know, you'll hope everything works for the best. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so as you have kind of made this career progression over the years, has networking at all played a role in your career progression? Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's essential. Um, one of the things when I was with, um, with ORCID a long time ago now, mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of great mentors. Um, just wonderful people that really invested a lot into my life. And even with Lennox did that as well. They invested just a ton of time with mentoring and training. Um, and But there's a certain point in which you're no longer, you don't have people that have time to mentor you anymore mm -hmm. because now that level is much higher. Right. And so um, professional networking is very important. And I want to stress, it's more than just having drinks after work you know, one day a month or whatever like that. That's that's um, that's shallow networking. What mm -hmm. I what I try to do with with the people that I work with, um, I find people that have similar beliefs in me than with me with regards to lean or manufacturing or dealing with people, and then uh, I invite them to come here. So I'll have maybe I, I have like three or four people right now, uh -huh. where they'll come here, they'll look at my plant. I'll go there. I'll look at their plan. Oh, that's interesting. We hold each other accountable. Yeah. So we had a big uh, we had a big meeting a couple of weeks ago. We had other plant managers come in and they just walked the floor. I walked them through our roadmap for the next six months, which mm -hmm. I plan on them coming back in six months and saying, I told the whole team, I said, I want you to take this list and I want you to hold me accountable to it. And six months from now, this is where I need to be. And it really generated a lot of great conversation because 
I also need to call them for their help. In fact, yeah. in just two weeks, we've been on the phone constantly. You know, this, I need this, you need that. I'm going to send somebody over to your plant to train you guys and, and whatever. And you're going to have, there. I've got two supervisors from another plant coming over here to train and lean. Yeah. Uh, and we're just kind of doing a little bit of horse trading. But the idea is that we hold each other accountable uh, for making those goals. And that's real true networking is mm-hmm. being able to, to, to have mentors and build that relationship. No, that's such a great idea because honestly, as you go up higher and higher in your career, in some ways you become more isolated because you're the only plant manager or you're the only whatever head of whatever. And if you don't take the time to make those connections, you don't have anyone to compare notes with. You could be going, you could be off track for a year and never even know it. You know, your people might not feel comfortable telling you something or, you know, you're not listening or whatever it might be. and, And no one's sitting there saying, Jonathan, you're off course. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a humbling thing for sure, but it's a, it's a necessity. So when you were early in your career, you mentioned that you had mentors. Mm-hmm. Did you acquire those mentors through like a mentorship program or did you seek them out? Uh, when I was younger, I, I just, I got blessed. I was very much blessed with the people that, that came across my life. And some of them are, are still very close friends of mine. Um, now I seek them out. Okay. Uh, now it's very much a. When I was younger, it, mm-hmm. I was young and dumb. I mean, <laughs> we didn't know back then, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just blessed enough to have those people there to say, Jonathan, I see something in you. I want to invest in you. And I, I'm like, okay, you know, let's do this. But mm-hmm. now it's very much, I still need that investment. Mm-hmm. I have something worth. Uh, I can invest myself into someone else's life. Yeah. Uh, and so there's that cohort relationship a lot of times now. So now when you kind of pursue these uh, networking relationships, how do you, do you come out and say it to someone what you're trying to do or does it just happen over time? Like what happens? It's got to be, there's, there's different le- layers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's probably the more superficial relationships that are kind of like, oh yeah, let's have lunch sometime or whatever. Uh, but then there's, some people that you meet, they're like, okay, there's a genuine uh, talent here that I want to cultivate and mm-hmm. I want to add to this. And there's something that I, that can be had here. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't go to just anybody. It's right. definitely a, a, a picky process, but they're the same way. I mean, it's like, uh, it's almost like saying, I want to, I want you to be my godfather or something right. like that. You can't <laughs> yeah. just throw that out there. Right. It's got to be a very uh, calculated conversation for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. So you've been in really different industries, right? So now you're working on guitars. Mm-hmm. Do you find that you end up, have you ever worked with the same person more than once? Like, or have you crossed paths with people like yeah. it, later? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Memphis is like that all the time. Yeah. I've, I think I've had one person see me in three different companies. <laughs> Yeah. So you kind of mentioned that when we were walking around and I think sometimes when people leave their current company, they're often unhappy and it's like they want to almost burn the building down sort of a thing on their way out. And then you get to the next building and there's the same people. You don't want to do that. (laughs) Do not do that. No, it's funny. I I have, uh, you know, when people leave, I'll have a conversation with them all the time, just doing doing an extra interview with them. And they're like, Like, well, I don't care. I'm never going. I'm never going back to this industry or whatever. I'm like, you never know, right? What you're going to run into. Yeah. So, um, I've been there. I've I've had my finger on the the send button before. Right. <laughs> that could have probably ruined my career. And you just have to take a step back and say, you know, is this really necessary? Right. You know, is it really important that I say it? Or is it just okay to just walk away and just have a good relationship? So Yeah, I advised someone once they asked me that question. They were doing an exit interview, and they said, I want to tell them all this stuff. And I said, well, let's talk about it. So is there anything you're going to tell them they don't know, first right. of all? And do you think it will change anything for them? And the answer was, no, it probably won't. And I said, well, what will it change for you? <laughs> well, you can no longer get a reference. You can no longer, <laughs> like, right. you know. So it's kind of like I think you have to think about it. But I just got that sense as you were talking that. Yeah, you just never know who you're going to run into. But, yeah, right. if you have the option, just hold, bite your tongue and move on. I mean, there's all kinds of people in this world. And I'm sure there's people that want to burn a bridge with me when they left me. And it's just just don't do it. Right, no. right. So you mentioned as we were talking earlier that LinkedIn is something that you use. Yes, I use LinkedIn like exclusively. That's great. A lot of people ask me if I think LinkedIn is still a thing or if it's actually important. It sounds like for you it's it's worked quite well. 
I think LinkedIn is, uh, from a social media standpoint, is probably the best for professional networking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, is you got to be careful, like who you invite into that mm-hmm. that that relationship, because um, you know I'm always weeding people out of there that have topics of the posting that are not relevant to work. Right. Um, I'm not into supporting that. Right. If 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 I'm going to have a, a professional network, we're going to talk about professional things because mm-hmm. I go there for professional answers. I seek out individuals for answers and I don't need to hear about someone's cat. Yeah, on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless your job is cats, I don't really care. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the thing I also found interesting with your LinkedIn profile is you have taken advantage of recommendations. So people actually, and maybe they've, it's just happened, but people have left you some recommendations. Mm-hmm. And one of them I saw in particular, and I'm going to quote from it, it said that you have the rare combination of engineering talent and professional salesmanship. And it really caught my eye because that combination, when someone will comment on both engineering and salesmanship in the same sentence, um, it's pretty unusual. It's not what you, it's not what engineers are known for. So my guess is that you've done some work to kind of lay a foundation for, to be known as someone who is well-rounded. Um, how have you been able to kind of do that as well as to kind of leverage your engineering background with your people skills? Um, yeah, it's uh, interesting. So, so hitting on the question a little bit before we get started with the answer, yeah. the, you know, engineering, engineers, unfortunately, in school, they don't teach you how to be social, mm-hmm. right? Um, nine times out of 10, and I'm not, I don't mean to no, go for it. Bonked anything about engineering, <laughs> but we're not the best at communicating. We're just not. We we your brain moves a mile a minute, and you're thinking about the solution way before anybody's even understood the problem. So, uh, I had an opportunity early on. I didn't. I was that way, mm-hmm. and I am still that way sometimes. But uh, early on, I had an opportunity with uh, some of those great mentors I was talking about to go to another country and be a salesperson. A, a sales engineer is what I was. Mm-hmm. And I what learned, country were you in? I'm sorry. I was in Germany. Okay. I was in Germany for two years. And uh, it, so I was a sales engineer over there, and I learned very quickly that no one wants to really be sold to, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you go to a, a car lot or, if, or you're buying something of a, any sizable amount, you don't want this sleazy salesperson-y feel to wipe over you, and it's just awful. Uh, and so what I've done, what I did there was I said, okay, uh, let's find the pain that this customer is having mm-hmm. and, and, and start doing some root cause on that pain. Mm-hmm. So you talk to them in a very logical way within the bounds of your capability. You can't solve world hunger for that person. But you could say, okay, I can solve this small problem and maybe we can move, work on to a better problem. And what they really taught me was how to, how to train people. It's mm-hmm. funny how it all worked out. Um, and so even now, so, so now I'm a plant manager and, 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 one of the problems I have now is as an engineer, I already have the solution in my head. Yeah. And that's really, that's probably the hardest thing is to say, we have problem X, Y, Z, Jonathan, what should we do? And I just want to say, we'll do that. Right, and then right. That's the answer, but I can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, I'll always be solving the problems. And so mm-hmm. what I have to tell them is like, well, what do you think? Or let's use the tools that we learned. And they'll come up with like a pretty good answer. Mm-hmm. And it might not be the best. And I always have to bite my tongue and say, mm mm-hmm. It's all about selling. These, that's a customer. People are customers just like anybody else. My employees are my customers. They right now need to learn how to do this. It's okay that we take this interim step, and then you know, in a month or so, I'll push them toward the next answer. Yeah. So, uh, I had, I, like I said, I was lucky enough to go into sales and kind of, kind of work those legs out a little bit. Uh, I was thrown in an area where I didn't have any anybody to lean on, so I had to figure it all out on my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just kind of came naturally. You know, you, you think about it. From uh, a customer standpoint, you say, what does this customer need? What do they find as value? Right. Uh, they want a solution. They don't want to be sold anything. Yeah. Let's try to f- use our talent to find a solution for them. Oh, that's great. So I'm curious, what were you selling? Uh, uh, medical devices, uh, cutting tools, uh, implants, uh, yeah. oh my God, hips and knees. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I um, studied engineering also. And you mentioned socializing. I think in four years of college, I went to one party. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's engineering life for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was in my, my room all the time yeah. studying. It was all science and math. I didn't have any normal classes. Um, no, no, not at all. Yeah. I, I think I went to another college to take out uh, a literature class I didn't want to take. It right. <laughs> yeah. 
that was yeah. Funny. Yeah, I'm with you. I almost went into sales engineering as well. I a uh, carrier tried to convince me to come sell large air conditioning units to hospitals. Oh. Um, but I think if you're the engineer who could a little bit talk to people, they kind of try to pull you in that direction. But I, I could see how it would be really helpful. It, it's funny that people do look for engineers that can interact. Mm-hmm. If you have any semblance of personality and you have an engineering background, <laughs> uh, there are people chomping at the bit to get you. That's right. Um, I heard a recruiter once say that, um, you know, MBAs now are kind of like a dime a dozen. People are getting them all over the place. I agree, and yeah. I currently don't have mine. But the uh, he said if you could get an engineer, mechanical or industrial, and get them with a MBA from a, re- a renowned college, like that is the corporate level CFO, CEO positions that they are trying to fill with are people that have an MBA but have an engineering background. Yeah. And it's not easy to get. It's a nice combination. I have my MBA as well. And um, certainly companies, I think, give you – they really will take a second look at you if you, you know, have that yeah. background. But absolutely, they're kind of a dime a dozen at this point. Well, yeah, and it's it's not that it's what the undergrad was in, which it really is important. So right. they, they funnel you through this program, which is really great, and I'm right. speaking to it, but I haven't been in it yet, so right. my apologies. But, but the idea is what your undergrad was in, you mm-hmm. know, what was their baseline in before they went into it, and that speaks a lot to the the, the color that they'll have when they come out of it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That's interesting. Um, so you kind of touched on it a little bit, but you know, in my mind, as a plant manager, you're using leadership, right? Mm-hmm. You're working with people. That's really kind of the the foundation. But you also are able to sort of bring your engineering background in. Where do you find that that helps you as a plant manager? <clears throat> um, training is probably the biggest thing, and I alluded to earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a small plant. It's not very big. We have to wear a lot of different hats, and okay. uh, one of the ones I've taken on recently is is doing some some training, and particularly in this case, lean training. And so, uh, teaching people the concept of customer value, increasing customer value, and reducing waste uh, is a hard thing for people to grasp. If they can figure that out, they can we can walk them through the different tools it takes them to get there, and then we could really have a a uh, a golden era of, of a plant if, if you mm-hmm. can really figure these tools out. But you can't do it alone. I can't do mm-hmm. it alone. My team can't do it alone. So we really have to engage every single employee. And so that's really where uh, these tools, for me personally, come into play. They say, okay, I have to sit down every single person in the plant and personally talk with them about how this really works. And that's what we did. We did that a couple months ago. We walked everybody through just some basics, about two-hour training session. Um, we had about eight of them. And, and we walked through, you know, what this means. And I think when we were done, we really did hit home with about 80%, 90% of the population that mm-hmm. this is uh, where we need to go. This mm-hmm. is something we need to do. So That's interesting. So how many people do you have working here? Uh, around 100. 100, wow. Yeah, okay. 100. And are you, you're not producing guitars around the clock, I would assume. You're, no, we're, a, we're still just a first shift operation. Okay. Yep. Okay, that makes yep. a lot of sense. That makes sense. And in terms of, so your previous industry before this was not at all related to music. No. How long, from your perspective, did it take you some time to sort of, were there tools and things that were different? Like, how long did it take you to kind of figure it all out? Um, not long. I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be braggadocious or anything, but it did take long. It, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, if you think about, let's say lean manufacturing, because I use that, I use mm-hmm that as a touchstone a lot there's a lot of things that are common with all industries you know right. the way that you root cause something the way that you do an analysis of whatever issues that are out, that are out there the way you measure stuff is very similar it's yeah. just the product is different yeah yeah so if you if you if you find like you prescribe to the the religion of lean manufacturing it's really applicable to all these other areas of life sure. um, uh, not just manufacturing, it, it can be in the way that you shop at the grocery store. And yeah. so you, you take these ideals and you 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 institute them all throughout your life and, and people pick up on that and you can pick up on new things all the time. So it's yeah, not that I, hard. I could see that. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I would assume that um, your friends and family find this job much more exciting. Yes, yes. <laughs> of course, a lot of them really wanted me to hook them up with a new stove, but oh. with Electrolux, but... Oh, I see. So maybe... <laughs> I think there were some people that were a little disappointed, but uh, I've got other people that... It's funny. 
yeah, hook me up with a guitar. I'm like, no. Right, go right. Buy, go buy one. <laughs> That's funny. Well, so when we were emailing and kind of setting this all up, you emailed something to me that uh, really stuck with me. And you mentioned that you have certain principles that you try to live by, both professionally and personally, mm-hmm. that have really helped you to be successful. And I would just love it if you would share with us a little bit about those principles. Uh, sure. Um, you know, a lot of it we've already talked about, mm-hmm. the idea of continuous improvement, both personally and professionally, um, having mentors, uh, accountability partners, both professionally and personally. Mm-hmm. That's so important. You know, you can't live life without um, mm-hmm. interacting with other people. Uh, so that's just a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and wrapped that wraps around just two things, really, is my family. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had to make some very tough moves person- personally and professionally mm-hmm. uh, because of changes in our family situation. So, sure. um, you know, some of these companies I've been with recently haven't been very long, and that's uh, not everybody likes that. You know, when you're looking at a resume, when I have a resume in front of me and somebody hasn't been at a company but a couple of years, you're like, well, wait a minute, you know, what happened? And and so um, I've had to make some really tough decisions based on family situations that have come up and mm-hmm. required me to move for uh, for my in-laws were one of them and my, my daughter was another one. So, mm-hmm. um, but I did. I made that move. I, I, I made a step out in faith and mm-hmm. it, it worked. It worked out very well. And then that's the second thing is faith. And so um, having a belief that, um, that uh, you know, that there is this higher power, mm-hmm. right? That I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm given this opportunity to, to, to witness that and to, to speak to that is very important. And it, it's, it, I honestly believe it's played a lot in the way that I've been blessed throughout my entire life. So, mm-hmm. so the family, uh, the faith, and then this is the idea of mentorship. Uh, you've got to have accountability on both sides of the street. Um, I've got people that I would never tell anything about my personal life to, but they're definitely a great professional mentor. And then mm-hmm. there's people that have no idea what manufacturing is at all. Mm-hmm. But they're just, they understand my life. They understand my family and my, my different situations I've had to come in contact with throughout the year. So keeping all those balls in the air, that's, that's, that's it. That's what's really makes me tick, I guess. Yeah. No, that's great. It sounds like community, whether it's professional or personal or family, has always played a really big role for you. Yeah, and it's not easy. You know, it's really tough sometimes. Like when I moved to Grenada, I w- basically walked into this vast, empty black hole of no communication with anybody. Oh, wow. And that's really tough. I mean, yeah. um, I was on the phone a lot with people just trying to reconnect with people. And, and that was that was probably a, a pretty dark time. But, uh, but as of late, it's actually gotten a lot better and I'm able to reinstitute a lot of those ideas. So it's, it's really good. Really yeah, that's interesting. So you brought up something else I, I find really interesting, which is, um, and I tend to find it's a generational divide that I work on with a lot of my clients. Uh, my parents' generation, for example, and my grandparents had an expectation that they would stay at the same job for 20 or 30 years and retire from that company versus people in their 20s and 30s. It's much more normal that you would go from company to company every couple of years. It's actually, in a way, it helps to diversify your career. Mm-hmm. You learn more. You network more. I mean, I would have to imagine that the different moves that you've made, you've also gained a lot of knowledge and, and things doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, that's a great question because my father um, was is very traditional. He's been with mm-hmm. the same company for like thirty years. Yeah. And when I was with Orchid, I was with Orchid for about twelve to thirteen years before I left them. Yeah. And my father, I remember, it was a very tough decision because they're my family. Yeah. And my father was like, "You can't leave them. They're your family. <laughs> you just can't do it." And I'm like, "But I have to. I have to. Mm-hmm. I have to." F- push myself more mm-hmm. um, because I will get stuck in, in, in this role. And so I did. And looking back, it was one of the better decisions I've ever made because I, yeah. I you're right. I would not have understood what it's like to be in a, you know, a million square foot facility with a thousand employees and, you know, 10 supervisors working around the clock. I mean, yeah. I never would have understood that if it hadn't been for those moves. And so, um, so I could see I could see the other side of it, right. you know, longevity and and commitment. But you also have to have a company that's willing to invest mm-hmm. uh, in the employee that understands that the employee has 
a pathway that they need to walk through Mm -hmm. uh, and keeping them challenged. Mm -hmm. That's super hard for companies to do. Yeah. But I also understand it on the other side of the street as the, as the person you have to challenge yourself. So. Well, I think the industry in general is a lot different now than it was 20 years ago. Companies are forced more often to restructure and to change things and, you know, benefits are really different. So what I think you walk away with when you have such a diverse experience is you become this really world-class, you know, person in this space, someone right. who's been exposed to things and someone that uh, <clears throat> other companies would seek out because they know that you've had this kind of interesting experience. So, well, so speaking of uh, positions and roles and hiring, what kinds of positions do you hire for here at Gibson? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we got a few things. Uh, the hardest one to fill is supervisors, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a tough role. Yeah. And it's a, a grueling, a grueling job. And, uh, uh, that's, that's one of the biggest ones is trying to find supervisors. It's always fun. So what kind of background does a supervisor have? Um, you know, sometimes we look for the from a woodworking standpoint or from a guitar standpoint, but that's really for me. I feel like we could teach that. Yeah. Uh, maybe with the guitar, you know, if they they have some some guitar background, that's important in certain areas of the shop. But again, it comes down to willing to learn, willing to work, and and having a good attitude. Yeah. Um, some experience in supervision is important. Right. You have to know how to deal with tough situations, tough people, how mm-hmm. to. Uh, diffuse certain situations, and and that's invaluable. If you have if you have four or five years of uh, supervisory experience beforehand, it's it's very important to have something like that. But, yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, so and you hire supervisors, and then what other kinds of roles? Oh uh, yeah, so we'll have uh, some of the plant workers. You know, from uh, we have different craftsmen that do uh, a lot of woodworking. So there might be some background in woodworking there, which is. I think right now uh, there are some people out there that have that background that are, are looking for a job, so that's yeah. that's a great thing to have that for people. Uh, there are certain roles in the shop that require people to play, and so having... Oh, uh, really? Like play the guitar? Yeah, so while we've been sitting here, you've probably heard four or five guitars being played to make sure that they play. Oh, that's you know, so cool. I don't know if it picks up the mics, but that's back there. And... Uh, uh, and then there's, you know, everything in between. We've got uh, auto bodies guys that were from the auto body industry that are excellent painters. Oh. Um, we got an artist out there that that just is phenomenal with airbrushing and just different things that we're, yeah. we're doing some fun stuff with. So just a very varied background. And that's really the key, though. It doesn't matter what the background is. Yeah. There's little tools that people have that will add to the diversity of the group. But the idea is that they're great attitude. Uh, willing to learn and willing to work. Okay, that's great. So occasionally I do see that you have positions posted on your website, yeah. and I occasionally share those postings, but I know um, I'm sure there's tons of people, especially in Memphis, who would love to check them out. Um, one thing that I asked you earlier was, uh, do you are most of your employees musicians? And it sounded like, although they sometimes are, it's not a requirement. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, you don't have to be a musician to, to work here. There are certain positions, like I said, that you have to be, but not all of them. In fact, there's only a handful that require it. Okay, so. very good. Well, we have covered just a ton of different topics. Is there any other advice that you'd like to share with our listeners? I know we've got a lot of technology folks um, who probably are very envious of sort of what you've been able to do. Yeah, I mean, just rem- if I think I've said it a couple times, if, if you remember that... Um, you find out what the what the customer is that they they find valuable. Whether that customer is your employees that are working for you, or the HR person that's looking for a position to be filled, or or anything, mm-hmm. um, understand what that customer's value is. Uh, one of the analogies I always put out there, uh, I, I I use the idea of flying on a plane. Mm-hmm. Right? We look at the process of what it takes to fly on a plane, and we say, okay, from parking your car to checking out the rental car at the at your final destination you took every piece that it took for you to get to that point mm-hmm. you spread them on a table and i said they all had a little bit of a dollar amount to them and i said here's a thousand dollars a thousand dollars will buy all of these things but what are you going to spend your money on right to get from point a to point b and every every time they said well i'm just going to buy the flight it's just getting in you know checking your bag and going through the check-in and and doing security and then going to get a candy bar at the you know, if that's a thousand dollar candy bar, none of that is important, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? What's important is 
getting in the plane, going up in the air, and coming back down where you want to be. Mm-hmm. That's what I'll spend my money on. And, and that, that can be applied to anything. Mm-hmm. Figuring out what that person needs uh, and, then, and then how do you fit in that equation? Can I increase that value for them? Can I get it to them faster? Can I get rid of all this other waste? Or in the case of an HR person, how do I fit that position that they find important? Absolutely. Absolutely. That totally makes sense. And I think that's a great lesson for everyone, not just our technology folks. Well, Jonathan, thank you for joining me today. And thank you for taking us on the tour. It was really great. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Tune in next week for another edition of the Copeland Coaching Podcast. And if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher to make sure you never miss an episode. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.